Rob Brome is principal of cybersecurity at EY. Rob, it's great to see you. How is the threat landscape evolving in the cybersecurity realm for national defense organizations and for the government enterprise as a whole? Yeah, so I think the cyber landscape is constantly changing. Every single day, there's new vulnerabilities that are identified that people don't always understand how to remediate them. Those are called zero day vulnerabilities and it happens consistently. So it's always evolving, it's always changing. And then the other aspect I'll add into this for at least the federal government and the defense is now you have to do that with less resources, less dollars, less people that have recently you know, departed the federal government. So it's a, it's a constantly evolving landscape with less resources. So it's a very difficult time right now. You've got three concepts that you're advising people to uh, be aware of. The first is to know your environment because your adversaries are going to know yours. Mm -hmm. I think anybody that pays any attention to this is aware of the, uh, the number of breaches and the number of threat actors that are perpetrating those breaches. Mm -hmm. How does one go about knowing one's adversaries and how can one have confidence that one knows those adversaries sufficiently well? Yeah, so knowing your adversaries comes down to threat intelligence, right? So there's there's constantly, there's, there's new feeds that come out on a daily basis to understand what those adversaries are doing in order to gain access to networks. And by understanding what those adversaries are doing, it can help you build better protections for your own network to really have that, you know, two phases. I know what my adversaries are doing. I know the tactics, techniques, and procedures that they're playing and where they're doing it. So I know what my specific threats are based off what's happening in the wild. And I can actually modify my own security to meet those needs on a, on a consistent basis. You told me a moment ago about three areas of the environment in particular, mm -hmm. uh, internal, external suppliers, and threats. What are the best ways to be aware of how each of those uh, areas is affecting the overall environment in which someone's operating? Yeah, so internally, it's about having continuous monitoring and understanding of your entire environment. And there's technologies currently that are available that scan on a consistent basis so you can understand what is actually in my environment and what do I think I have in my environment and make sure that they're matching as much as possible. And that's the internal, and that's from both a, an IT perspective, potentially an operational technology perspective, and really figuring all that out. The other piece on the internal that you really need to think about are the identities, the people that are operating within your environment. Do they have the, the right access at the right time across your environment based off of their specific role of what they're executing. Those are also things to constantly consider. And if you think about, you know, people, they usually stay in a job for a couple of years. Do they still have that access after they've already shifted jobs multiple times? So it's really understanding, you know, what's inside of your environment from an asset perspective, what's inside of your environment from a people perspective. And then I know we mentioned also that external aspect too, what suppliers are operating in your environment and what potential risks do they present to your organization? The second item that you're writing about is simplifying and prioritizing cyber services. The simplification one seems to be maybe the more challenging than the other for government organizations. I don't think anybody anymore isn't prioritizing their cybersecurity posture, but simplifying it, I imagine, could be quite challenging. Yeah, I, I think it's both, right? And I think the, the government construct, there's legacy systems, so it can be very, very hard to simplify you know, what's out there. So you know, a concept I like using is creating almost security architectures or using you know, something called DevSecOps, so development, security, and operations as you're building software, building IT, so that security is baked in and built into anything that you're creating. And many, it's commercial organizations, and before I came to the government, I did a lot of work commercially, and they've established environments where all of the security is built into those environments. So if I wanna build a specific system or an application, I go to that environment, I bring my data and my identities to that environment, I build my system in there, and all of the security is already built in. So it helps to simplify the environment by having one environment specifically to secure versus having multiple. Beyond DevSecOps, where are the opportunities, do you think, for government organizations to simplify their cybersecurity structures? So, I mean, the architecture one is the first in creating kind of, I would say, secure architectures for an organization and an environment. The other one I'd say to, to help to simplify is prioritization, 
right? So there's the, the NIST risk management framework that's been utilized in the government for, for many, many, many years. And that relays control, security controls, which are what you use to basically help to mitigate the risks in your environment. But many of them are, according to these documents, created similar and created equally. But that's not always the case, right? Not a single control should be the exact same because you should be applying the ones that make or mean the most for that organization or that mission set. And those are the ones you should be focusing and prioritizing efforts on versus some that are more, let's say, um, detective controls, right? You wanna make sure you're proactively, you know, working throughout the environment, proactively identifying and remediating threats. So you can, there's ways to prioritize differently and, ch and change what I would call kind of checkbox compliance into conducting true security for your organization based off of prioritization. And that's very important because less resources, less people, you have to prioritize how you spend your time. The third item that you, uh, that you write here is validating cybersecurity. And you frame it this way, change happens consistently, so be sure to trust but verify. Verify what is important there? Yeah, verifying that you actually have the appropriate security in your environment. So, and, I'll, and what I would kind of just add on to there is trust nobody and verify everything throughout your environment. Uh, so that's very, very important to do. And you're, you're verifying, do I have the right security in my environment? Do I have the technical components built in to actually drive security? And a lot of, I'd say, assessments are what I would call feelings-based assessments. So I will, you know, meet, you know, meet with the stakeholder and say, how is security in your environment? How are you doing? Right. And they'll tell you how they feel about their security and where it is. We want to change that to more technical focused assessments where you're actually getting under the hood of those systems, under the hood of those environments and really evaluating the security as it's being completed in those in that on that system. It sounds like you're taking the zero trust concept to the next level. It's not just the people who are accessing the system. It's everything about the system that is undergoing a, a verification process on an ongoing basis. Am I hearing you right? Absolutely. Because one potential misconfiguration could lead to an entire data set to be open to the public. So making sure that those security risks are truly being validated. You know, so we're finding those risks you're uh, basically remediating those risks, and then you're validating them after you think you've remediated them to make sure they truly are actually closed. Rob Brome, great to have you here. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for your time.